Well, this morning we are going to be carrying on our theme of looking at the covenants of the Bible. And last time I spoke, I spoke about the law of Moses. And I said that the next time I spoke, I was going to look at how the law of Moses relates to us as Christian believers. And uh, <clears throat> it's an interesting question. But before I attempt to answer it, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for your presence, which we have sensed even so far today, and your sweet stillness and peace with us. Lord, thank you for your living word. Please anoint it with your Holy Spirit now and anoint both the speaker and the hearers, and may we be shaped and changed by the power of your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, there's just a very slight echo. I think this just needs to go down very slightly, please. <clears throat> what is the relationship of the law of Moses to us as believers today? Well, um, if I strictly kept the law of Moses, I shouldn't have had a bacon roll this morning. In fact, I didn't have one, but if anybody did, they shouldn't have had um, I, in the summer, I like to wear clothes which are mainly cotton or linen to keep cool. But in the winter, I wear clothes which are wool mixed with other things. Well, that's another contravention of the law of Moses. In, in my last house, because it didn't have cavity walls, it used to get a damp problem, mildew on the walls. Hopefully it's being dealt with by now, but... If that got any worse, the house needed to come down according to the law of Moses. And uh, I like a steak with a little bit of pink in the middle. Again, that would not be permitted by the law of Moses. And in fact, this whole business was quite a hot potato at the time of the early church because there were a number of Jews who became believers in Jesus and some of them were from the religious order of the day. And there were a number of other Jews that did not like this new sect of the way, they called it, Christianity. Because they seemed to be preaching a different law to the law of Moses. And they insisted, these people, that if you became a believer, you should be circumcised. If you were a man, you should follow the law of Moses implicitly. But Paul and his associates said no. We're saved by the grace of Christ alone. And <clears throat> that is what we're looking at this morning. Uh, I want to draw, I've got two texts I'm going to read, for, which are words of Jesus. And if, they're not my main text of the day, but I just want to uh, have them uh, for you to hear because. Jesus had something to say about this subject himself. The first one is Matthew 5, 17 to 20, and it will appear on the screen. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, <clears throat> you will not enter the kingdom of heaven." The key phrase in what Jesus says there is that he's come to fulfill the law. He's come to fulfill it. How did he do that? <clears throat> well, partly in his teaching. You know, the law said, do not murder, do not kill, do not commit adultery. He said, if you look lustfully at a woman, you commit adultery. If you are angry with someone and curse them, then you commit murder. So he put a new and a greater fulfillment onto the meaning of the law. In other words, it's not about externals, it's about heart attitude. So 
that was one thing that he did, but also, and we're going to look at this more closely uh, later, he fulfilled the law in the sacrificial sense of the law when he died on the cross. He removed uh, our sin and its penalty by his death <clears throat> on the cross. Then we move over to Matthew chapter 22 and verses 34 to 40. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to read this. This is, it says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. It's a bit like the nations getting, to, getting together to conspire against the Lord and his anointed. They got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You see, the civil law and the social laws that were given to the Israelites by Moses no longer apply in a literal sense. Some of the principles of them do. But when it comes to God's moral law, they very much do still apply. And they're summed up in these two commandments. Love God with heart, mind, soul, and other versions say strength. Um, in other words, he's first, he's number one. We live for God who created us. And number two, we love our neighbor as ourselves. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Like a door hangs on its two hinges, all the law hangs on those two. In other words, under the umbrella of those commandments are God's full moral law. <clears throat> so, given all of that, how should we then live as Christian believers fulfilling the law? There is one passage of Scripture which to me is the best summary of this uh, position that we are now in. And uh, I'm going to ask Khan if she could come and read Romans chapter 8 and verses 1 to 4. And this is the nub of what I want to share this morning. I think this one's now working. Get it up. Thanks. Just turn it, just speak, darling. Life through the Spirit. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Jesus Christ, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful passage, and I should have said right at the beginning, a title of this message is The Fulfilled Life in Christ and His Spirit. We <clears throat> fulfill uh, the law because of what Jesus has done and because he has sent us his spirit, and this little passage unpacks that. Let's start with this wonderful phrase for Christians. 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful uh, statement of the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> to be condemned, it's rather a horrible position. We talk about condemned buildings, don't we? Um, and actually, on the Clifton Road, for those of us who live around those parts, you will know that there was a tower block there which was condemned because it, w it had so many things wrong with it that it's now being pulled down. And I understand they're going to build some new social housing there. I don't know if it's happened yet. But the buildings come down, it was condemned. But when it comes to people, being condemned is not a pleasant position to be in, is it? I remember watching a news bulletin a few years ago of a man, I think he'd been a military leader in a coup or something like that, and he'd probably committed atrocities, and he was being led out to be executed. He was wearing just a vest and a pair of trousers and walking along the road with people around him, and his face was just poker face. A man condemned. And the Americans talk about dead men walking, a dead man walking, don't they? Which means when they take you out of the cell to go to the place of execution, dead man walking. Well, here's a thought for us all this morning. Without Jesus, we are dead people walking on this earth. We do not know or have a relationship with the living God. And uh, <clears throat> we're out, as one of my preacher friends put it, like this. Human beings are out on probation. But someday we'll all have to stand before a holy God and give an account of our lives. And the pass mark is 100%. Nobody uh, will have got there. Quite a sombering thing. And to feel condemned <clears throat> is to have a sense of foreboding, a sense of things aren't quite right in my life. And uh, <clears throat> if we're really honest, you and I have had those feelings. And <clears throat> I think the Bible talks about people living in the fear of death. And they do. People have that uneasy feeling uh, that death is going to bring in something not very pleasant, and they're right. But praise God, <clears throat> there's a way out. <clears throat> there's a way in which we can come back to Jesus. God, as our brother Marcus was saying this morning, God so loved the world that he gave, he sent his one and only Son into this earth, and he had the likeness of sinful nature. That doesn't mean that Jesus had a sinful nature. It means he had human flesh and blood. It means that he got tired. It means that he got hungry. It means that he was also subject to every single temptation that you and I are. And yet he was without sin. But he took on human flesh. And then he went to the cross. And God laid on him all your wrongdoing and all mine and punished Jesus in our place with the punishment we deserve. So that if we believe in Jesus, we can be acquitted by God. The slate wiped clean, forgiven. Not only that, it talks about for those, <clears throat> there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? It means you're joined to him. Organically, you're joined to him. It means you're clothed with his righteousness. It means that when God the Father looks at you, he sees his Son. And he says of you, you are my beloved. I love you. Period because you are in my Son. That is how it is. It's all a gift of God. And if you've never given your life to Jesus this morning, and there may be some listening online today, well, who will see this film, I would just invite you 
to admit that you have wrong in your life, ask Jesus to be your saviour, and then acknowledge him as the Lord of your life from then on. And you will begin this wonderful life with Jesus. <clears throat> so this is part of the story. God has fulfilled the law for every believer through Jesus Christ. Nothing to do with what you or I have done, everything to do with what he has done. It's all of his grace, his undeserved favor. But that's only half the story, which is the amazing thing. You see, God could have just forgiven us, made us righteous, and then said, well, when you die, you can come to be with me, but that's not the full gift of salvation. The other half of the equation is he has given us a special gift. That gift is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who now can empower you and me to live lives that fulfill his law, in other words, lives of love, uh, by his power and by his motivation. And that's what he says here. You see, he says, <clears throat> the law was powerless to help us to become perfect. I can't, you know, follow all God's laws on my own strength. I just can't. Because I have a sinful nature that's still resident within me. But now, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death, and I can live, according to uh, what Paul says here, I can live not to my flesh or sinful nature, but according to the spirit. I can live according to the spirit. That means if I surrender my life to the control of the Holy Spirit, then I will be empowered to live a life of love. And I'm going to talk about life in the Spirit now. Uh, you can just put that uh, last slide up, please, Peter. I've got three points for you. They all begin with the letter S to help you remember them a bit better. <clears throat> and uh, the first one, uh, I'm talking about life in the Spirit now. The first one, and we've had it all through this morning, is the sovereignty of the Spirit the sovereignty of the Spirit. Um, I'd like you please just to put up the verse, uh, I don't know if I gave it to you actually, but Romans chapter 5 and verse 21. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to dot around Romans a bit because Paul is saying the same thing through a few chapters. He says, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through Jesus Christ, through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, when you become a Christian, we are transferred from the dominion of Satan and darkness to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is where Jesus reigns. So when we become a Christian, <clears throat> we give our allegiance to the king. And we are required thereafter, in the words of the song, to seek first his kingdom in our lives on a daily basis. You see, Jesus said, whoever comes after me must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Now, there comes a point in the life of every person who acknowledges Jesus when they have to settle the issue, who's the boss? Is it me or is it Jesus? And <clears throat> at the age of 18, I, I felt Jesus challenging me, or God the Father, I either want all of you or none of you. Because I was a Christian, but I still had one foot in the world. <clears throat> and uh, I came to a point of surrender. But I realized that that wasn't the end. Because every day I have choices to make. And uh, unless I'm in that place of submission to the king, then I can still do my own thing in my own strength. But God wants you and me to be controlled, led, and sensitive to his spirit in our everyday lives. 
<clears throat> and so this is the most important thing. <clears throat> and that means, of course, <clears throat> other things that set themselves up for my attention, <clears throat> and one of the biggest in our culture today is money and materialism, that has to be second. There's nothing wrong with things. God's given us everything richly to enjoy. <clears throat> but it's wrong <clears throat> if things become number one in our lives. <clears throat> Andrew spoke last week, and I thought it was very eloquent, <clears throat> about Gideon and his father, who had a, an altar to Baal in his own house. Well, what do we have in our houses <clears throat> which may set themselves up to compete with the kingship of Jesus? <clears throat> so let's keep our lives surrendered to him. And we do that <clears throat> when we taste his love every day. You see, it's not like God has a big stick over you and me, but he does have the shadow of the cross over you and me. <clears throat> and every day when I'm reminded of his great love for me, I, I want to say, Lord, take my body once more as a living sacrifice. Fill me afresh with your spirit. Let me live a life today that glorifies you by his power. <clears throat> so that's my first S, the sovereignty of the Spirit. The second one is service by the Spirit. Service by the Spirit. In Romans chapter 7, and I think we've got this verse, <clears throat> verse 6, Paul says, But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, that is, striving to keep God's law on our own strength, which we can't do, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We have been set free to live a life of love, a life of love for God. You know, Jesus is the pearl of great price, isn't he? for which it's worth laying everything down. A life of God, love for God and a life of love for those people around me. Uh, that means in my family, my spouse, my children if I have them, grandchildren. It means in my workplace, my colleagues and my customers or clients or pupils if I, or students. A life of love among them, <clears throat> a life of love in the church. You see, the kingdom should operate above everything else in the church. That means I get rid of resentment, unforgiveness, bitterness, impatience, and I seek instead to accept my brother and my sister as they accept me with all my foibles, weaknesses, <clears throat> and basically I want to suggest this, that love has an aim. With the unbeliever, my primary aim is to love them, yes, but with a, with a view to them coming to find Jesus. We're all called to be witnesses for Jesus, and I find this the most exciting thing in the world, don't you? We're on a mission to see people come to know Jesus. And you may be the only person in your street or in your family or in your workplace who can be a light for Jesus. You're called to be a witness. We do all of this by the power of his spirit. You know, and as we, w well, let me just say um, something about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We are here a charismatic church, that is, we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, when was the last time you had a prophetic word for somebody? Or a word of encouragement? When was the last time that you prayed for somebody who was sick? When was the last time you felt you had a word of wisdom for someone or knowledge? I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I make it my prayer regularly. I have a list of them that I'm asking the Lord to give me. 
And one of them is the gift of faith, because if I'm going to pray for the sick, I want to believe that Jesus is going to do something. So the gifts of the Spirit. And you may say, oh, we don't have much time on a Sunday morning to exercise the gifts. Well, you've got time on a Wednesday evening, quarter to eight this Wednesday. I, I invite you all to come and enjoy an hour in the presence of God. And we have free reign of the gifts of the Spirit at that setting. <clears throat> um, so, but in our home groups as well, and in our families, we can use the gifts of the Spirit. So, <clears throat> a life of service. We're called to serve the King. And, of course, in the church, there are plenty of avenues for service as well. And if you want to serve in any way, shape, or form and are not currently doing so, just please plead to one of the leaders and we'll help you to find an avenue of service. But my third S, and this one might seem a bit heavy, but uh, I'm going to share it with you, is slaying the deeds of the sinful nature. Uh, in the uh, past decades, we talked about being slain in the spirit having a nice time and being knocked over by the Spirit. Now, please, don't, I'm not knocking that because there were some ger very genuine encounters of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit wants to slay you in another way. It's those things in our lives which aren't quite Christ-like at this point. You see, what God wants to produce in you and me is the beautiful fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. This is the package of the Holy Spirit, his beautiful fruit, and he wants to produce it in you and me. You know, what God is most interested in in my life, I've come to the conclusion, is not primarily what I do for him, but it's who I become. Ewan Robertson in Christ Jesus. And God wants that for you as well, above everything else, that you become the person he created you to be. But it does mean that we need to look to the Lord to help us in some of our weaknesses. Uh, <clears throat> and you know what those things are in your life. Uh, I'm not talking about here having a kind of internal witch hunt, but we do need to be conscious of weaknesses. There are such things as what the old saints used to call besetting sins. It means those things which we find difficult to shake off. It might be a problem with anger. It might be a problem with looking at stuff that we shouldn't be looking at. It might be anxiety. Do you know that actually anxiety is something that the Lord wants you to get over. I mean, we all fear, fear things, and that's okay, but we, it's what we do with the fear that counts. Do we take it to the Lord, pray about it, and then trust him to help us, or do we continue to carry them? And what about resentment and unforgiveness? These are hard things I'm sharing this morning but the Lord wants to help you and me to deal with them by the power of his Spirit. And I want to be very practical here. Uh, in another letter, the letter to the Galatians, Paul talks about crucifying the sinful nature. I like that analogy because crucifixion was a slow and painful death. In other words, we won't necessarily instantaneously be set free from something. Sometimes God does do that, but sometimes it takes a process of cooperation with him. And so let me share with you some practical pointers on this to help us. First of all, I think we should always have an attitude of repentance. Repentance is not something we lose after we become a Christian. It means this, when I become conscious of a wrongdoing, I want to put it right with the Lord, ASAP. And he's always there to forgive. Always. Never feel you're condemned because there isn't any, as this scripture in Romans says. You can always go back to him and receive forgiveness, even if it's 77 times 7 that you've fallen to the same thing. He's always there to forgive. 
Secondly, I found in my life that sometimes I need to make a specific time of, with the Lord in prayer, where I say, Lord, I know this is a problem in my life. I need your help, please. Please help me to overcome this. And sometimes I've enjoyed the blessing of drawing aside with the Lord for a little bit of fasting as well, because I find that that, uh, the Lord, somehow draws very close in those times. But the third thing is, for some things in our lives, it might be good to make ourselves accountable to a more mature Christian. Might be one of the leaders in the church, needn't be. But someone who is conscious that we're going through a struggle, someone who's not going to condemn us, someone who's going to stand with us, and someone who's going to check up how we're doing and pray with us. And that leads me to my last point, which is it's also beneficial sometimes to seek counsel. To seek counsel. Uh, Alan's written a, a wonderful book, The Practitioners of the Soul. And uh, sometimes we need the help of somebody who is attuned to the Holy Spirit, who can just help us through an issue. I remember when I was in uh, a church down south for a while, there was a lady there who was one of the leaders of the church, and she was also a counselor by profession. And she gave some basic counseling training to the church. Um, and one of the phrases she, she used has stuck with me. She said, the issue that presents is not usually the issue. The issue that presents is not easily, usually the issue. In other words, there are roots to our behaviors. And sometimes we need the help of a skilled counselor to find out what those root issues are and to stand with us to have them uprooted by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, this is part of living the law of the Spirit of life. It's really living under the control of the Spirit. And this is the freedom to which we've been called. Uh, we've been released from the penalty of breaking God's law because of the death of Christ. He fulfilled the law in his life and in his sacrificial death. And now we can fulfill the obligation we have to love God and to love others by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Amen? Amen. I'd like us to finish, please. Uh, the musicians are going to come and lead us in that beautiful song, In Christ Alone. And as we sing this song, let us reflect on what God has done for us in Christ. And there's a line in the song, I can't remember it, it, it where it says, the power is there. I can't remember the exact line. But reflect on these things. And uh, you may need to do some business with God later on this day in the light of something that I've shared. Uh, let it be so. Okay, thank you, David.